Hi, and welcome to a new episode of Don't Be a Man About It. My guest is an actor, and he has been co-starred in TV shows like the NCIS or Criminal Minds. He also teaches TV production in the university. Matthew Arkin, thank you for being here on the show. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for having me. How Pleasure are you? Pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, awesome. You know, it's, it's, it's been an interesting, complicated year, but, uh, but uh, doing well. You? I'm glad to hear that. I'm doing great, actually. I'm one of those people who enjoyed the lockdown. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've found it to be a, a period of um, incredible productivity. Mm. Uh, sort of bit, that's how I've, uh, my, my coping mechanism has been to, to become as productive as I possibly can. Well, each person did the best that they can. And it's amazing the stories that you hear from people, different kind of stories, different kind of experiences to the same event. Yes. Yeah. I know some people who are dealing with it by sitting on the couch and eating watching you know, television I'm, and eating. I'm thankful and grateful I'm not one of those people. <laughs> yeah, me too. So Matthew, how is your heart doing today? My heart? Uh, that's interesting that you would ask that. Um, it's very interesting that you would ask that because um, a, a few days ago, I would have said my heart was not doing very well. Uh, I'm, I'm single and I've been single for, for quite a while and, um, and, uh, for several years and, uh, was starting to feel sort of, um, well, you know, I'm 60 and maybe that part of my life is just receding in importance. Uh, and then the pandemic came and I felt like that, you know, my heart and the idea of relationship and romance or, or any kind of uh, significant other got sort of locked away for me. And then for, for no reason I have been able to discern, I had a dream a few nights ago where um, I was sitting alone at a bar in Grand Central Station in New York City, which is where I, I used to commute through and it's very busy area. And one of the things about n being born and raised in New York is everybody talks about how New York is a huge city. And, and yet every time I'm in, in New York, I may be walking and I will almost always bump into somebody I know in this <laughs> huge city. But so in this dream, I was sitting at this bar in Grand Central Station alone. And as I sat there, I kept bumping into friends and colleagues who would come walking over and say hello to me and we'd chat for a few minutes and then they'd leave. And after this was going on for a while, a, a woman who was sitting in another area of the bar noticed that people kept coming up and talking to me. And so she, she walked over and introduced herself and said something like, you, you must be very, you have a lot of friends. You must be very interesting. I want to talk to you. And we sat there for hours and talked and fell in love. And I woke up, this was just like three nights ago. And I woke up that morning feeling just this set, this renewed sense of hope and possibility about the future. Um, and then a, a very similar dream again, the next night. So it's sort of changed my, um, how my heart is doing today than, than what I would have said a few days ago. I don't know if that's the kind of answer you were looking for, but that's. Well, that's beautiful. The, <laughs> the question doesn't have a right or wrong answer. <laughs> that's beautiful. Well, sending you all the love all the way from Dubai to New York. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Matthew. Yeah, and, and back at you. Thank you. Well received. So you are an actor. Yes. And the reason why I was so excited to do this episode is because years, years, years back, long time ago, I dated an actor. I'm and so I, sorry. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but 
It was one of the most beautiful relationships I've ever had, but also it was one of the most challenging ones. And it, it brought to my attention that I've always wanted to discuss the entertainment industry and its relation to mental health and how actors or performers, artists, do they really take care of their mental health? And because we have heard a lot of sad and tragedies where actors or singers would die by suicide. So that's one, one reason among the many reasons why I would, uh, I invited you to the show. So as an actor yourself, you've, you've starred in NCIS, Criminal Minds and other shows. Have you ever been into depression because of the industry? Um, I, I haven't really suffered from depression related to the industry. I've, I've, I've struggled episodically, uh, with, with depression in my life, just as, as I think so many people do. Yeah. Um, but I, I do see, uh, and, and I also think you know, to your point about the stories of the suicides and the uh, that we see in the industry, I, I'm not sure how much of that is um, a statistical anomaly versus other industries, or what we see because our industry gets a lot of press and attention because mm -hmm. of film and celebrity and publicity, etc. You know, there are certainly the the tragedies like like Robin Williams and um, this uh, this face of you know the, the depression being the flip side of comedy um, mm. that that so often incredible comic talent grows out of a coping mechanism perhaps uh, for dealing with. Uh, darkness either in 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 our own interior or as a reaction of darkness to darkness in the world around us um a uh of a, a dear friend of mine uh, a rabbi was once asked uh the question about why um in america certainly comedy is so identified as jewish comics and and uh and those uh aspects of comedy in in our culture and he he gave this very long erudite answer about comedy as a uh a reaction to adversity um and uh it gave a this very long learned answer to the question but then ended it by saying of course, by my analysis, the Native American should be the funniest person on the face of the earth, you know, because because they they've they've suffered more adversity perhaps than 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 almost any other uh, group. Um, uh, but in terms of getting back to your point about depression and and the entertainment industry, um, I do see. The th a thread among artists of that there is this idea that my my struggle my depression my darkness my neuroses might be the source of my talent yeah. uh, I I don't feel that. Uh, yeah, I don't feel that, but I think it's a prevalent idea. And this idea of that, if I get healthy, I will be boring. I won't have, I won't have the well to draw on that I need to draw on to be creative. Um, and I don't think that's true. I don't think it ever goes away that well. You know, I've, uh, I've spoken to my therapist about certain, you know, issues that I've struggled with and that I've made tremendous progress on. And she, and I'll say at times, you know, when will this go away? When will I not think about this anymore? And she said, she says, never, 
you know, it's never going to go away. It's never going to not be a part of your past and your memory. The, the goal of mental health is not to eradicate those things, but to stop them from controlling you from controlling for you, from impeding your progress, from stopping you from getting what you want in life and what you need. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that every experience that we've had as artists, happy or sad or traumatic, they are always gonna be there for us to draw on in our art. They're not gonna go away because we've found a way through them and a way to be healthier. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that the, the question of mental health is then so, so crucial for actors because it can uh, show us how to um, use those elements without them hurting us. Interesting, yeah. Um... It's it's what I what I'm trying to to understand is that the movie industry or e the entertainment industry in general is a huge outlet and platform for people to send a message, and yes. most of the time, we rarely see movies. We do. There are quite a few, but do you really think the movie industry or the entertainment industry focuses and highlights enough on mental health? Like you mentioned Robin Williams. Robin Williams had the, um, uh, what is, what's the movie, What Dreams May Come. And What Dreams May Come was one of the most powerful movies I've ever watched related to depression and suicide. And yet Robin Williams lost his life to suicide. So, what do, do you think the entertainment industry is focusing and highlighting enough on mental health or not yet? Uh, not, I, I don't think necessarily that it is. Um, it's not a, uh, um, it's not something I've obviously done a, a study of, uh, I, but, uh, but I don't think we, we do um i don't think in television or in film we uh we have focused on that issue that there are other issues right now that are that are for a lot of political reasons you know much more uh i don't know if they're they're more pressing but they're certainly they're they're more to the fore uh and, and they're all important issues. The, the, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, issues of diversity and uh, uh, social justice and uh, racial equality uh, are getting, and rightly so, a lot of attention now uh, in the industry. Um, but, but certainly mental health could, could benefit from more. As an actor, did you take roles you were not convinced of? Uh, I've never, I've never done anything that I was um, that I found objectionable. Mm -hmm. um, I've done, I've done roles, you know, for economic reasons that I didn't care so much about. Um, but I, I've never, I've never performed in anything where I felt like this, this says something bad. This puts a message out into the world that I, I, I think is harmful. Um, I've, I've performed in things where I think the message is frivolous, you know, cause I have to put food on the table. So you, you get a job and, you know, what's interesting is in my work, um, my, my television work, which is the thing which is the most remunerative, you know, you make the most money working in television and film, much more than in theater. Um, that's all been, you know, things like, uh, you know, Hawaii Five O or Law and Order, which are interesting and entertaining, but they're not you know, people are going to watch an episode of that show and be entertained and then move on with their lives. Those, those are not performances or pieces of work that are going to stick with people for a long time. 
and it, it, it's been in my theatrical work where I've had the opportunity to perform in pieces that that did have a, a long lasting that I know because of things that people have walked up to me on the street and told me had a long lasting positive effect on their lives. Um, and, you know, and I've written about that uh, and the idea that, you know, certainly as an artist, that's, that's what you hope for. You know, you hope that, that you will give somebody somewhere a gift that, that helps them with something they're facing. Um, and uh, it's certainly not something that I think um, oh, that I get credit for it, but it is a privilege to be involved in, in a project that does that for people. Um, you know, I heard a story years ago from a, a friend uh, who was struggling with depression when she was in um, uh, college. She was differently abled and she felt lonely and unattractive and uh, unable to have any kind of social life. Um, and she was uh, had been contemplating suicide for a while. And on this one particular evening, I think she was a junior in college, was... Uh, going to kill herself and she'd gotten you know a nice big bottle of vodka and a whole bunch of sleeping pills and was setting them out on the table in front of her and the movie uh the movie it's a wonderful life came on television and she had never seen it and she was setting her stuff out and looked up and the movie started and she sat there and watched the whole movie from beginning to end and when it was over, she dumped out the bottle of vodka in the sink and flushed the sleeping pills down the toilet. Now, Frank Capra doesn't know that story, obviously, right? The, the director of that movie. Yeah. J uh, Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed don't know that, but they saved somebody's life. Um, and, you know, that's, that is, as an artist certainly not on every project. Uh, you know, I don't think an episode of Hawaii Five-O that I was in is going to save anybody's life. But there are these projects that come along that you send out into the universe and you hope that those ripples reach somebody on some distant shore and provide them some comfort or relief. I totally agree. And... Um... We need more of that. I do believe when someone has a platform, you know, or a stage or somewhere where you could send a message and actually save a life, why don't you use it? Not only properly, but also invite others to join you on that stage. And let's make something huge. Let's make something rich to not only millions, but billions. So do you think the lack of attention or highlights to mental health in the entertainment industry is it because of the production is it because of it's not cool enough is it because uh, i don't know why why do you think among all of the topics discussed already there's still not that strong production related to mental health uh, I would imagine, um, like so many things in this world, it's driven by economics. You know, mental health is not, uh, if you throw it out there with a bunch of other topics, people aren't going to say, oh, that's, that's what I want to plop my $18 down uh, on a ticket for. That's not entertaining. It's not sexy. It's not action packed. Um, I can go watch a movie about, um, uh, depression, or I can go watch uh, the latest Avengers movie. Uh, you're going to have a bigger box office with uh, the latest Avengers movie. Um, so I, I think that's I think that's probably one of the big drivers of of content. <laughs> <laughs> they should create a Marvel movie where a therapist saves the world. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
or where or where Captain America struggles with depression. There you go, or loneliness, <laughs> or bipolar disorder, or anything. It's not. A, I I believe that with the right amount of creativity, you could send any message in the whole world. It's just a matter of I want to make things happen. If that woman was not watching that movie, maybe she would have been dead by now. So, yeah. And without people, there would be no economy. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> really a cycle here. Uh, and I'm not saying that all of the movies and all of the industry has to just focus on mental health, but we do need right. realistic movies, not only romantic, uh, you know, romantic stories where the, 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 um, the love story ends with a marriage, with a proposal, with a, you know, um, we need more realistic, especially that what I am mostly concerned about are the kids watching those movies. So yeah. why don't we educate them in a funny way or not a funny way, in a fun way, in a easy, simple, just as watching a movie? Yeah, no, I think you make a good point. Directors? Listen to my message. And yes. That. <laughs> there you go. Well, I think you should write something. Oh, all right. Maybe. I, th I think you should write uh, a script about this. Uh-huh. I will. Now I have to. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Ladies and gents, be tuned. Um, Matthew, you mentioned earlier that you are going to a therapist. Would you like to share why? Um, well, uh, there was a lot of, uh, well, I think, basically, I think everybody needs to go to a therapist. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, specifically for me, uh, there was a lot of uh, divorce and uh, early childhood trauma in my life that, uh that I needed help working through. Um, and in doing that, I found that I liked the, the process of therapy that I felt, you know, that even after a lot of those issues were not um, getting in my way anymore, yeah. um, that there were, uh, that other issues crop up and that it becomes, you know, when, when I started therapy and I think a lot of people think of therapy this way, uh, they think of therapy as, um, oh, something to help you through when something is wrong. Uh, but there's another view of it is that what about something to help you then make things more right? We, we don't only go to the gym for physical therapy after an injury. We also then go to the gym to stay in the in optimal physical condition. Or I've, I've heard that people do that. I, I, I perhaps don't as much as I should. Um, <laughs> I've been told that going to the gym can be good for you. Um, but, uh, but I think, I think mental health and mental health professionals should be viewed the same way. Uh, why, why, why go only when something is wrong? Why not go to keep making things more right? Um, and, and that's what it has become for me is more a practice to keep my life on the track that I want it to be on. I love that. I absolutely love that. Well, Matthew, um, my parents got a divorce when I was 18. And I remember it affected my dad and it left a huge impact on him in a negative way. He still loved my mother where it was the quite the opposite when she just wanted to go and live her life fully without us and without him. And I do remember how sad he became after the divorce. And I don't think he ever recovered from that. How does divorce affected you as a man? Because the society here usually supports more divorced women emotionally or mentally where men are just you're gonna be okay you're gonna be fine here's a beer so i'm really 
I'm really interested in getting people to know more the side of a man after a divorce or after a huge, let's say, event, turn of events in a not very healthy way. Hmm. That's an interesting question. I, I never really thought about, I, I never thought and examined the idea of the, the difference between the support that a man gets after divorce versus the support that a woman does in terms of the societal view. I, I never really thought about that and, and can really only speak to my experience as an adult. Yeah, as an adult, when I went through my, when I went through my divorce, uh, which was um, 13 years ago, um, uh, I, we had two children, um, fantastic kid, amazing kids. And um, the, the divorce was emotionally, uh, even though it was, it was m much more my decision, it was also uh, much, it was, I won't say more devastating to me emotionally than, than my ex-wife, because uh, I, I can't say that, but, but it was much more devastating for me than I anticipated it being. And uh, a lot of the reason for that was because um, the, the divorces in my childhood and the custody battles uh, and the, the moving back and forth between one parent and another was, ver was the source of a lot of trauma for me. And I will say with a great deal of pride that my ex-wife and I did not put our kids through that. Yeah. We were able to continue co-parenting. We presented a united front for them. We didn't, they didn't get shuttled back and there wasn't a custody battle. Uh, there wasn't uh, either of us saying bad things about the other. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody was saying your father's a monster, your mother's a monster. You know, there was none of that for my kids. But because the stuff that I had gone through as a child was so traumatic, I had a really difficult time because I couldn't see that we weren't putting our kids through that. I, I felt I have done to my kids what was done to me. And that, that caused me a lot of difficulty for, for many years that I needed a lot of help working through. Um, I, I couldn't see the reality in front of me that, I mean, I'm not saying, oh, that my kids were like, yippee, mom and dad are getting divorced. You know, of course they were sad about it. And of course it's, it's caused them their own issues that they've needed to, to work through. Uh, and, um, but not, not the depth of trauma that my brothers and I went through. Uh, but I was completely incapable of seeing that. Thank you for being open about this. Um, not a lot of men or parents would be open and honest about their decisions um, to get a divorce or the aftermath after it. Um, so thank you. Oh, of course. I mean, that's what we're here for. <laughs> so is there anything back then you wanted in terms of maybe emotional support, but you never got because you were busy maybe taking care of your kids or maintaining your life? Um, no, I, I did get the help that I needed, um, not through my own um offices i uh, when i was in the worst way that i could be uh, members of my family noticed it and stepped up and and encouraged me to get the help that i needed um and without them uh without their having intervened the way they did i don't know that i would have made it um so i'm i'm really 
really grateful for that, that help. Well, I am grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh... And, 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 you know, and then look, you know, look, and I'm, I'm grateful too, because, um, you know, the gift of, of my kids that I can enjoy now. And I, I remember I'll, I'll tell kind of a funny story uh, that in, in one episode with, with a, a therapist at that time where I was really in crisis, um, at the end of our session, she said to me, okay, um, from now on at our sessions, you're, uh, you're not allowed to talk about your kids. And I said, I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and she said, you're in crisis. And we've spent most of this hour talking about your children. She said, I get it. You love them. <laughs> we have to talk about you and make sure that you're okay so that you can be there for your kids. So you can't talk about your kids anymore. And it was so hard. It was so hard to do. But she was absolutely right. Absolutely, absolutely. Because when you think about it, how could you take care of any thing or anyone if you're not taking care of yourself you can do it maybe for months or years but then automatically everything will shut up hence depression or suicidal thoughts so yeah it's the old uh, that metaphor of you know on the airplane you got to put the oxygen on yourself and then put it on the person next to you and it's a tough lesson where i believe a lot of people including myself that we had to learn that very hard way yeah yeah so are you taking care of yourself now boy i hope so, so <laughs> yeah yeah let's say before and after pardon me what has changed in your life or in your habits or routines especially when it comes to self-care before and after before and after the the covid you're talking about no or um, what I meant was before and after your divorce or before and after oh, therapy. So how yeah. did that change your... Um, well, uh, continuing therapy, uh, conscious self-care, uh, you know, you used that phrase and that was not something that I was, that ever had my conscious focus of, of setting aside time and saying, you know, checking in with myself. Am, am I okay? Uh, what do I need to do to be taking care of myself um, physically, emotionally, spiritually? Um, and making, um, taking conscious steps to safeguard my well being rather than thinking of it as something that, well, we just have to see what happens with that, whether or not I'm okay. You know, thinking about thinking about my well-being as a project that I want to accomplish the way I would accomplish some other project. Make lists. I make a lot. I, I, I'm a big believer in making lists. I love <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Or maybe a message you'd like to send to men listening? Um, the message that I would send to men listening is to talk about your feelings. Um, and, uh, a, a therapist of mine once said, um, he told a story about, um, a young soldier coming to a general uh, the young and the young soldier really wanted to to be the best soldier he could be and asked the general what you know what do i do in battle to be the best soldier i can be and the general said run towards the sound of the cannons um and and i think as you know as a man or a woman you need to be willing to go to the place where that is frightening and where you think there might be danger in order to get the work done 
you know, in order to battle your demons, you have to go towards them, not ignore them. Because uh, uh, what you ignore will will bite you on the rear end. <laughs> Absolutely. There you go. That's a synopsis of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Always. Until the next episode, I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.